So I mentioned that there were th two large phase three randomized trials. The other one is what's referred to as the Murano study. Um, that trial was designed based on a phase 1B trial that Dr. Ma, you um, have presented at, at prior meetings with venetoclax plus rituximab. Now, venetoclax is approved in relapsed patients who have 17P deletion. In the U.S. now, there's a less restrictive label in, in Europe, but if for the time being in the U.S., we're limited to prescribing it um, for patients who have relapsed disease with 17P. The trial that you were participating in enrolled relapsed patients. Maybe you can give us a little bit of perspective from that trial and then maybe summarize the Murano results for sure. us. Sure, yeah. So um, venetoclax is an orally available BCL2 inhibitor, so which is really targeting the epiplotic machine directly. Uh, so uh, the trial that was uh, leading to the approval was based on patients with 17P deletion. And then we have uh, presented uh, in ASH uh, 2015 and 16 the combination of venetoclax with rituximab in previously treated patients. So those patients who had a median prior treatment of two. Uh, so with that combination, we have seen a very uh, high response rate of overall response rate of 86% with a complete response rate of 51%. And what's more remarkable is that um, the bone marrow MRD negativity, so minimal residual disease negative bone marrow, uh, was achieved in active 57% of patients. So these are relapse refractory patients. This is almost unprecedented that we have seen with prior immunochemotherapy or other uh, oral agents. So that's very encouraging, the depth and uh, also the durability of the response. The uh, pro uh, progression-free survival has not been reached. The two-year progression-free survival with the venetoclax rituximab combination was 82%. So very encouraging data from that phase 1B study. Um, and we also had a patient who actually, uh, once they achieve MRD negativity, uh, they uh, have the option to either stop or continue the venetoclax monotherapy. So there are 13 patients who actually stopped mm -hmm. venetoclax treatment. Uh, among the 13 patients, two of them were MRD positive CR and 11 of those were MRD negative. So the only patient who progressed to date are the two patients who had MRD positivity at the time when they stopped. So that means that when, once you're able to achieve the uh, negative MRD status in the marrow, then those patients can potentially still have quite durable response um, of treatment. And do you expect re-response when patients are Right, so the two patients who relapsed uh, after alpha-nataclax, actually they relapsed uh, about 24 months after stopping the treatment. And both of the tri patients were retreated with venetoclax rituximab, and both of them uh, had achieved response again. I, have so one, I actually have one patient like that from a, one of the early trials uh, who was MRD negative and stopped for, for well, a year or two, and then was mm -hmm. able to go back on and uh, responded nicely. Right. So based on that very encouraging phase 1B data, the Murano study was designed as a large phase 3 randomized study comparing venetoclax plus rituximab versus bendamustine rituximab combination. So you have a novel combination versus the conventional immunochemotherapy. So these are for patients with relapse refractory CLL. And the Moreno study really showed that the uh, uh, response is fantastic. And uh, what's more remarkable mm -hmm. is that the uh, progression-free survival was uh, significantly prolonged uh, in patients who were treated with the venetoclax rituximab combination. Yeah, so with the uh, uh, hazard ratio is uh, 0.17. So, Nicole, can just, you comment on how you manage relapsed disease? Sure. I was going to bring up make one your, point. Make it, yeah, it, it, what's interesting about this, which I think we didn't discuss, um, was that it, it, what's different is here an antibody with venetoclax is clearly different than an antibody with abrutinib. I, I think that we haven't seen as impressive results when we add an antibody to abrutinib, but I do think the combination with venetoclax is more striking. And so that will, you know, whether it be rituximab or binituzumab, but I think that, you know, that combination is better than venetoclax alone. So. Um, Sorry. And just to elaborate, we, Jan Berger presented yeah. uh, data from our, from our trial. We had a randomized trial with ibrutinib plus or minus rituximab. And all, other than the cosmetic effect of <laughs> more yeah, rapidly don't. bringing down the absolute lymphocyte count, the progression-free survival looks similar. similar. And there, th th there were a higher proportion of mm -hmm. patients who had, uh, were MRD negative who got rituximab, but that hasn't 
appeared to translate into anything meaningful in, in terms of the progression-free survival curve. And I think that's probably because everybody's remaining on ibrutinib. Yeah. So continuous, continuous therapy, MRD is less important and less of a relevant uh, endpoint compared with time-limited yeah, therapy. I agree. So maybe you can uh, maybe elaborate on your approach to relapse disease and what are the things that you think about when you're selecting treatment mm -hmm. for a relapse patient? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, so similar to what Matt had said earlier, I mean, part of it depends on what the patient might have received and how long their response was to that therapy. Of course, cytogenetics and, uh, and their mutational status is relevant as well. If we're looking at, we'll just talk about a few examples of somebody, we, we have obviously some data um, where if you starting a brutinib in frontline, what happens then if you relapse? Uh, what do you go to then? We have little uh, data when it comes to chemo immunotherapy post TKI initiation. Obviously, most of our patients had gone chemo immunotherapy mm -hmm. and then received TKIs in relapse, so we know what that scenario is. And because there's lots of those folks who were on those initial studies, if they then failed a brutinib, their you know their overall survival is poor, and so that's when you know, folks were being transitioned to venetoclax, for example. Um, and that certainly was able to salvage some of those patients, albeit I, those patients will drop off and you still need alternative therapies or clinical trials or if they're young enough to get a transplant or things like of that nature. Um, so I think in relapse, if they've had chemoimmunotherapy and then have a brutinib or a TKI going to venetoclax is a reason, reasonable approach. Um, if they have a TKI as frontline and then they relapse, the question remains, although there's some presentations that we had at this ASH meeting looking at if you start them uh, uh, with an antibody uh, and, uh, uh, you know, can you salvage an abrutinib and then can you salvage them or give chemoimmunotherapy? I think it's very young data, but certainly there's a possibility that you could mm -hmm. give chemoimmunotherapy and relapse or a BCL2 inhibitor. Of, of course, I think after a TKI would certainly not be unreasonable as well. So that's generally the approach that I've been taking if they're not going on a clinical trial, if they're multiply relapsed um, and then get abrutinib, then I'll transition them to venetoclax or venetoclax and an antibody. If they're um, newly on abrutinib and then they relapse. I'll still probably, a lot of them do not want to do chemoimmunotherapy. It's just that we don't have that data, but a lot of my patients won't, so then they're transitioning to venetoclax. Will the Murano data drive whether or yes. not you give venetoclax with rituximab? Yes. Uh, you know what, I mean, I, I, I always, you know, certainly in the error, although again, with the TKI data, it's been less impressive with venetoclax. I think it has been more impressive, so uh, um, I think that it, it uh, you know, certainly in the chemoimmunotherapy data, whenever we added a monoclonal antibody, it did better. Um, certainly the venetoclax data, I think, suggests that as well. So certainly I have no problem giving venetoclax in an antibody. We're going to talk about the new agents in just a minute, but before we move on, maybe, Steve, you can comment on uh, acalabrutinib, which was recently approved for mantle cell. Uh, it's a new BTK inhibitor, um, and uh, there was an abstract presented at this ASH, which was an update with the acalabrutinib experience. Yeah, so it's, a, it's the first of the second generation BTK inhibitors. Uh, it is, has a different profile than abrutinib. Uh, it's uh, thought to be more uh, specific of an inhibitor uh, for BTK, and so uh, theoretically at least perhaps a different side effect profile. You know, what about AFib? What about the, the bleeding, the, the, the platelet dysfunction that, that you see? Um, it is a BID drug. Uh, that's how it's uh, used as opposed to once a day. So, you know, patient compliance issues one has to consider. And so far the data is good. I mean, it it's, uh, it's, it certainly looks as good from an efficacy standpoint in the relapsed uh, refractory patients as you see with abrutinib. There's updated data of that trial by uh, Dr. Bird and colleagues uh, at the ASH meeting. Um, to be perfectly honest, it's, it's hard to truly draw conclusions about differentiation on side effect profiles. They are reporting less AFib, bleeding, it's hard to say. Uh, one uh, peculiar side effect early on is headache, mm -hmm. uh, which I think uh, is, is, you know, easily dealt with. But uh, it'll be interesting. They've done the appropriate trials. There's uh, an upfront trial compared to benetuzumab chlorambucil. There's actually a head-to-head -head trial with mm -hmm. abrutinib in high-risk high relapsed. Uh, there's a trial for abrutinib in tolerant patients. So we'll get good, good data. I think the drug will get approved for CLL, and then we'll see.
So for the irreversible BTK inhibitors, mm -hmm. there's an association with mutations in the cysteine 481 moiety, which is the target for the irreversible inhibitors. There are new ones that were presented right. um, or have been discussed at this meeting. Maybe you can briefly review what those are and what's the direction. For sure, those. the one that comes to mind is the Sinesis compound. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a neat science uh, to me, and um, it probably would work perfectly fine there in those patients who have uh, developed those specific uh, resistant uh, mutations. But I think, you know, again, in the big picture, how, how common is that really going to be, uh, especially as we move these drugs up front? You know, so what role will it play except for an occasional patient? So, you know, time will tell.